And we're back. This is George Gilbert from Wikibon, and I'm here with Aman Neymat at uh, Demandbase, the pioneers in the next-gen AI, uh, AI generation of CRM. Yep. So, Aman, mm -hmm. let's continue where we left sure. off. So we're talking about um, natural language processing, and, and I think most people are familiar with it more on the sort of B2C technology where sure. the big internet providers have um, sort of accumulated a lot of uh, voice data and have learned how to process it and translate it into, or, or convert it into text. Um, so tell us how B2B NLP is different, to use a lot of acronyms. Sure. In other words, how you're using it to build up a map of relationships between businesses. Right, yeah, we call it the demand graph. Um, so, so it's an interesting question because, firstly, it turns out that uh, while very different, B2B is also, language is quite boring. It doesn't evolve as fast as, you know, consumer, you know, concepts. And so it makes the problem much more approachable from a language understanding point of view. So natural language processing or natural language understanding is all about how machines can understand and, you know, take, um, you know, store and, and take action on language. Um, so it, it may, it, you know, while we were sort of working on this many years ago, I think now four or five years ago, and that's my background as well, it, it turned out the problem was simpler because, you know, human language is very rich. Um, and natural language processing, converting voice to text is trivial compared to understanding right. the meaning of things and words which is much more difficult. Um, or even the sense of the word. Apparently, in, in English, each word has six meanings, right? We call them word senses. So the problem was certainly simpler because B2B language doesn't tend to evolve as fast as human, you know, regular language. Okay. Because terms stick in an industry. Um, the challenge with B2B and why it was different was that each industry has, or sub-industry, has a very specific language and jargon and acronym. So uh, to really understand that industry, you need to come from that industry. So if you go back to the CRM example of, you know, what, what happens in the, in the, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you would have a salesperson who would come from that industry if you wanted to sell into it. And that still happens in some traditional companies, right? So the idea was to be able to replicate the knowledge that they would have uh, as if they came from that industry. So it's the language, the vocabularies, and then you know ultimately have a way of um, storing and taking action on it. It's very analogous to what Google had done with Knowledge Graph. Okay, tell us, all right. So two, two questions, I guess. First is, it sounds almost like a, a translation problem in the sense that you have some base language primitives, right. like partner, supplier, competitor, customer, sure. but that the, that the language in each industry is different. That's right. And so you have to map those down to those sort of primitives. Right. So tell us the process. You don't have on staff people who translate from every industry. I mean, that was the, you know, the whole translate or writing lo logical rules or expressions for language, um, you know, which was conventional or good old, good old fashioned AI is called. You mean that this was the, the, the rules 50. based, the That's knowledge, right. the, yeah, yeah, knowledge right. engineering. That's right. Um, and that clearly did not succeed um, because it was impossible to do it. The old quip, which was, um, one researcher said, every time I fired a, 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 a rules engineer, my accuracy score would go up. <laughs> That's right. And, and the problem is because language is evolving and the context is so different, right? So even pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. or in the Bay Area would use different language than pharma in Europe or, you know, in Switzerland. And so it was just impossible to be able to quantify the the variations and to do it manually to do it manually it's impossible it's only not possible for a small startup and we do we did try having it be generated 
And in the early days, we used to have you know crowdsource workers uh, validate the machine. But it, it turned out that that they couldn't do it either because they didn't understand pharmaceutical language either, right? <laughs> so in the end, the only way to do that was to have some sort of a model and some seed data and to be able to validate it or hire experts and have small samples of data to validate. So going back to the graph, right, it turns out that when we have seen sophisticated AI work, uh, you know, towards complex problems, so, you know, for example, predicting your next connection on LinkedIn or your next friend or what ads should you see on Facebook, they have used, you know, network-based data, you know, social graph data, or in the case of Google, it's the knowledge graph of how things are connected. And somehow machine learning and AI systems based on network data tend to be more powerful and more sort of um, intuitive than you know other types of models. So okay, so when you say model, help us with an example of you're, you're representing uh, a business and sort of who it's connected to and That's it's, right. its sort of place in the world. So the demand graph graph is basically you know is demand base. Who are our customers? Who are their partners? Who are their suppliers? Who are their competitors? And you know, utilizing that network of companies in a manner that we we have network of friends on LinkedIn or Facebook, and it turns out that business or businesses are extremely social in nature. In fact, we found that the connections between companies have more signal uh, and are more predictive of of, of acquisition or or um, being, you know, predict predicting the next customer than even, you know, the Facebook social graph. So it's much easier, or ha you know, to utilize the business graph, the B2B business graph to predict the next customer than to say, predict your next friend on Facebook. Okay, so, so that's a perfect analogy. So, so tell us, um, of the, about the raw material you churn through right. on the web, and then how you learn what that terminology might be. You've bootstrapped a little right. bit. Now you have all this data, right. and you have to make sense out of new terms. Right. And then you build this graph of right. who, how, who this business is related to. Right. And the hardest part is to be able to handle rumors and to be able to handle jokes like, you know, it, isn't it time for Microsoft to just buy Salesforce? Question mark, smiley face. <laughs> you know, so it's a, it's a challenging problem. It, it, but we were lucky that business language and business press is definitely more boring than, than you know, people talking about movies or... Or Reddit. Or Reddit, right. So the way we, we work is we, we process the entire business internet or the entire internet. And initially, we used to crawl it ourselves, but soon realized that, you know, Common Crawl, which is an open source foundation that has crawled the internet and put at least a large chunk of it, you know, and that really enabled us to stop the crawling. And we we read the entire internet and look at. Ultimately, we're interested in businesses because that's the world we are in business, B two B marketing and B two B sales. We look at wherever there's a company mentioned or a business person or a business title mention and then ignore everything else. Because if it doesn't have a company or a business person, we don't care, right? So, or a business product. Um, so we, we have, a, so we read the entire internet and then try to then, if we infer that, hey, this is, Amazon is mentioned in it, then we figure out, you know, is it the Amazon, the company, or is it Amazon, the river? So that's problem number one. So we call it the entity linking problem. And then we try to understand and piece together the various expressions of relationships between companies expressed in text. It could be a press release, it could be a, a competitive uh, analysis, it could be announcement of a new product, uh, it could be a supply chain relationship, it could be a rumor. And then we also, it also turns out the internet's very noisy, so we look at Corroboration across multiple disparate sources. Interesting to, to decide is sort of how is it true? The signal that's is right. It, is it is it real? 
right. or how yeah. real. Because uh, there's a lot of fake news out there. So, <laughs> so we look at uh, corroboration and the sources to be able to uh, infer if we can have confidence on this. I can imagine yeah. this could be applied to... Uh, a lot of other <laughs> problems. <laughs> political uh, issues. So, okay, so you've got all these sources. Tell, Give us some specific examples, you know, of of feeds, of sources, and then, and and help us understand, because this, I don't think we've heard a lot about the notion of bootstrapping, and then it's it sounds like you're generalizing, which is not something that yeah. most of us are familiar with, who, who have a, you know, a surface level familiarity yeah. with machine learning. I think there was a lot of research, like, you know, not to credit Google too much, but um, there was a, you know, bootstrapping methods were used, and you know, by Sergey, I think was was the first papers, and then he gave up because they founded Google and they moved on. Um, and since then, in two thousand and three, four, there was a lot of research around this topic. Um, you know, and it's in it's in the genre of unsupervised sort of machine learning models. And in the real world, because there's less label data, we tend to find that to be an extremely effective method to learn language, and obviously now with deep learning, it's also being utilized more unsupervised methods. Um, but the idea is really to, um, and this was around five years ago when we started building this graph, and I, I obviously don't know how the Google Knowledge Graph is built, but I can assume it's a similar technique. We don't tend to talk about um, how commercial products work that much. but. But the idea is basically to generalize uh, models or learn from a small seed of, you know, so let's say I put in seed like Nike and Adidas and say they compete, right? And then if you look at the entire internet and look at all the expressions of how Nike and Adidas are expressed together in language, it could be, you know, um, I think Nike shoes are better than Adidas. Ah, uh, so... It's not just that you find like an opinion that they're better than, but you find many, all many. the expressions that explain that they're different and their That's competition. Right. That's right. But we also find cases where somebody's saying, I bought Nike and Adidas, or Nike and Adidas uh, shoes are sold here. So we have to be able to be smart enough to discern when it's sub something else and not competition. Okay. So you've told us how this how this graph gets built out mm -hmm. so the um the you know the suppliers the the partners the customers right. the competitors now you've got this foundation and people and products as well. okay people yeah. products you've got this really rich foundation right now you build an application on top of it right tell us about crm with that foundation yeah i mean we have the demand graph in which we tie in also things around basic data that you could find like firmographics and intent and that we've also built. But it also turns out that the knowledge graph itself, our initial intuition was that we'll just expose this to end users or and they'll be able to figure it out. But it was just too complicated, right? It really needed another level of machinery and AI on top to take advantage of the graph and to be able to build prescriptive actions. An action could be, hey, um, I'm looking for to solve a business problem. A problem could be I'm looking for, you know, I'm a startup. I'm looking for a, a you know, a IoT startup. I'm looking for manufacturing companies who will buy my product. Or it could be I am a venture capital firm. I want to understand what other venture capital firms are investing in. Or hey, I'm Tesla and I'm looking for a new supplier for my, you know, the new Tesla screen. Or you know, things of that nature. So then we apply and build specific models, more machine learning or layers of machine learning to then solve specific business problems. Okay, so. Like the reinforcement learning to yeah. understand next best action. And, and are these models associated with one of your customers? No, they're general they're, purpose. Okay. They're packaged applications. Okay, tell us tell us more about so like what was the base level technology that you started with, you know, in terms of the 
being able to manage a, a, a customer conversation, a marketing conversation. Right. And then how did that get richer over time? Yeah, I mean, we we take our proprietary data sets that yeah. we have accumulated over the years and manufactured over the years with and then commingled with customer data and actually which is we keep private because they own the data and the technology is generic, but the, you're right that the model being generated by the machine is specific to every customer, right? So obviously, the next best action model for a pharmaceutical company is based on doctors visiting and you know what, what they're you know is this person an oncologist or where, what they're researching online, and that model is very different than a model for a demand base, for example, or Salesforce. Is the is it that the algorithms different or it's trained on different it's data. trained on different data, data. it's the same okay. code as i mean we only have 20 30 data scientists so we're right. obviously not going to build custom code for right. so the idea is it's the same model and it re, you know but the the same meta model but the it's trained on different data so a, a public data but also customers private data and how much does the customer Let's say your customer's Tesla. Right. How much of it is them running some of their data through this bootstrapping process um, versus how much of it is your model is set up and it just automatically, once you've bootstrapped it, yeah. it automatically starts learning from the interactions with the Tesla, you know, yeah. uh, it, with Tesla itself from all the different uh, partners and customers. Right. I think, you know, there's, we have found, you know, most, most startups are just like learning over small data sets, which are customer centric, right? What, what we have found is real magic happens when you take private data and combine it with large amounts of public data. So at demand base, we have massive amounts of public and proprietary data. And then we plug in and we have to tell you that, hey, our client is Tesla, so it understands the localized graph and knows the Tesla ecosystem, and that based on public data sets and our proprietary data. Then we also bring in your private slice whenever possible. Present. Slice of data. Oh. So we'll plug in, we have code that can plug into your website and then start understanding interactions that your customers are having. And then based on that, we're able to train our models. As much as possible, we try to automate the data capture process. So in essence, you know, using a sensor or using a uh, pixel on your website, and then we take that private stream of data and include it in a graph and merge it in, and that's where we find, you know, the pub. Our data by itself is not as powerful as our data mixed with your private data. So, I guess one way to think about it would be this: there's a, a skeletal graph, and, mm. and that may be sounding a little too minimalistic. Yeah, there's a graph. But when you work with, let's say, we, we take Tesla as the example. Sure. You tell them what data you need from them, and that trains the, the meta models, mm -hmm. and then it fleshes out the graph of the Tesla ecosystem. Right. And then Whatever data we couldn't yeah. get or infer from the outside. From the outside. Right, and we have a lot of proprietary data where we, we see online traffic, business traffic, what people are reading, you know, who's interested in what for hundreds of millions of people, right? And we have developed that technology. So we know a lot without actually getting people's private slides, but, you know, whenever possible, we want the maximum impact. So um, kind of like, it's, yeah. it's actually simple and let's, you know, divorce the, the words graphs for a second. It's yeah. really about like, let's say that I know you, right? And there's some information you can tell me about you. But if imagine if I Google your name and I read every document about you, every video you have produced, every blog you've written, then I have the best of both knowledge, right? Your private data from maybe your social graph on Facebook, and then your public data. And then if I knew, if I had, you know, you, if I partnered with Forbes and they told me whenever you logged in and read something on Forbes, then they'll give me that data. So now I really have a deep understanding of what you're interested in, who you are, what's your language, you know, what you're interested in. Okay. Because that is 
it's sort of like, you know, simplified, but similar at a much larger scale. All right. Let's take a pause at this at this point, and then we'll, we'll come back with part three. Excellent. 